الزكاه الحمد لله رب العالمين وافضل الصلاه واتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والاكرام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم tonight's session titled the stories of yemen it actually the connection between the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, the history of the Arab people in general and in Yemen, which is the area that occupies the southwestern corner of the Arabian Peninsula is really very well connected. And we know of at least four stories that either started in Yemen or took place in Yemen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran and the Prophet وسلم, authenticated in the hadith. One of those stories we've already uh, spoken about, and that is the story of the Queen of Shiva. The, query, the story of Sulaiman salam and his encounter with the Queen of Yemen, uh, Saba. And we need to go for the rest of, of these stories because they are really the prelude to understanding Arabia, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, the condition of Arabia around the time of the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. Yemen, like I said, occupies the corner of the Arabian Peninsula, the southern western corner of the Arabian Peninsula. Yemen is the origin of all Arabs. All Arabs, on all the different progeny and, and line, lineage of, of, of families and clans and tribes, they all end up in Yemen, according to the majority of the scholars. And from Yemen, the Arab divided into three different groups. The first group is called Al-Arab al baida the extinct Arabs. The extinct Arabs are Arab tribes, Arab clans, and Arab nations that don't, no, no longer exist. But we have their mention, in the history books, we have their mention in the Quran. We have their mention in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. There are two Arab tribes that are very well documented. And they have two Arab uh, prophets that were sent to them. And they are the tribe of Ad and the tribe of Thamud. So to Ad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet Hud. And to Thamud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet Salih. And both of these nations have been completely extinct. Extinct. Uh, there is also, you would read Aad al-Ula wa Aad al-Thaniya. There is the first Aad and the second Aad. And both of them are extinct. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said, وَأَنَّهُ أَهْلَكَ عَادًا الْأُولَى وَثَمُودَ فَمَا أَبْقَى That he uh, ruined and destroyed the first Aad. And then Thamud, he did not let them uh, survive. So, other tribes uh, of Al-Arab Al-Ba'ida, the extinct Arabs called uh, like Qusam, Judais, and Al-Amaliq. Uh, and, and these are names of many other tribes that you will see if, if someone is really interested in going into depth uh, for the pre-Islamic Arabic history. The second type of Arabs that came out of Yemen, and they preserved their lineage, they pre preserved their line of, of, uh, of nisab or of family lineage are al-Arab al-Ariba. What is called in the Arabic uh, language as the original Arabs or the authentic Arabs or the Arabs that go back to the to Qahtan. And uh, Qahtan is the grand great grandfather of that lineage of Arab people. And they are considered the initial tribes that came out of Yemen such as Himyar Quba'a, Khuza'a, and of them are two famous tribes in the history of Islam, and they are, they are Al-Aws wal Khazraj. Who are the Al-Aws wal Khazraj? They are Al-Ansar. They are the helpers and the supporters of the Prophet ﷺ in the city of the Prophet that was called Yathrib before the Hijrah, before the immigration of Prophet ﷺ. According to many scholars, uh, Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj belong to that branch of the Arabs, and that is the original Arabs. Uh, 
some scholars, however, you will read that in the minority, actually. There is some opinion that al Aws al Khazraj belong to the second part of the Arabs, and that is, or the third part, the second surviving or the third type of Arabs, and that are al Arabul Musta'ribah. Uh, that is the, what is called the Adnani Arabs. The Arabs that belong in their lineage to Adnan. Well, Adnan is one of the great grandsons of Ismail alayhi salam. So these are the Arabs that actually go in their lineage into Prophet Ismail alayhi salam and to Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now why are they separate from the, what is called the original Arabs is because Ibrahim was not an Arab. Ibrahim is not an Arab. Ibrahim is from the area of what is now Iraq uh, Babylonian, Chaldean, and that type of, of lineage. Uh, and when his son Ismail was put, was placed there along with his mother, Hajar, alayhi uh, rahmatullah salam, Ibrahim left them there. He, Ismail was a baby. And we, we studied that story. He was an infant. And we studied that story when we studied the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam. How he brought his wife and his infant son and he placed them in a valley that, that has no cultivation. And, and then he turned around and he started walking away and Hajar called on to him, are you leaving us here? There is nothing in that valley, there is no water, there is no plantations, there is nothing. And this is a weak woman with an infant. And Ibrahim alayhi salam would continue to walk. And then she called, uh, she said, Allahu amaraka bihada, is it Allah that commanded you to do so? And then Ibrahim alayhi salam would say yes. And then the believing woman Hajar, she said, إِذَا لَا يُضَيِّعُنَا Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not waste us, will not let us go astray. And she stays in that valley. And Ibrahim makes his supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring the hearts of people to that valley that has no cultivations, to bring, to, to bring the provision to his progeny in there. And Allah, and, and Allah responded to the supplication of his servant Ibrahim alayhi salam. And while after he left Hajar, she would look for water as her infant son would cry out of hunger and out of distress. And she would run between the two hills of As-Safa and Al-Marwa back and forth seven times looking for water and then the uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his angel to dig out the water of Zamzam right at the foot of Ismail alayhi salam and that is the story of the spring and the water of Zamzam that came out in honor of the progeny of Ibrahim alayhi salam responding to the dua of his prophet and his Khalil Ibrahim alayhi salam now, when that water came out in that area, it attracts birds, and attracts start getting plantation in, an, in a place that was absolute dry desert. And, and a tribe that was passing by, they saw that signs of water around that valley, and that tribe was Jorhum. And Jorhum, according to the ulama, it belonged to the first part of the, the Arab al-Ariba, the original or the Qahtani Arab. And they come to, uh, to the valley and they found only a woman and an infant. But they were noble people. They would not take the water without the permission of the woman that was at the water. Because according to them, she is in custody of that water. And Allah gave her the water for her honor and the honor of her child. And with the permission of Hajar, she allowed them to stay around the well of Zamzam. Ismail alayhi salam was raised amongst them and he learned the Arabic language and he was very eloquent in the Arabic language and then he married a first wife of Jorhum and then he married a second wife after that and we narrated the story of how uh, the wife was uh, divorced because of her uh, bad character and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the blessing of the second wife and of that wife he had, according to the scholars, 12 children. And of the 12 children came many progeny behind them. And that is 
what is called Al-Arab al mustarida The clans that came out of the children of Ismail, one of his great-grandchildren is called Adnan. And of Adnan, all of these tribes of the Arabs came. And of them Quraysh, the tribe of Prophet Mudar, Ghatafan, and of Ghatafan came Abs and Dubian. And, and these names obviously may not mean much, but if we study the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, there is some, some issues that will need really that type of understanding of why these tribes were, were one against another and what sort of allegiance and alliance they had. Because they had asabiyyah, they had the zealotry of, of tribalism. And it mattered to the Arabs before the Prophet ﷺ which tribe they belonged to, what trade, and, and they would really make a major distinction between even clans within one tribe. So of the Arab Mustariba, there were Quraysh, Mudar, Ghadafan, Thaqif, Thaqif the, the tribe that actually dominated the city of at Ta'if, and Bakr. Uh, and, and we will see how uh, even the alliances of Bakr and Khuza'a made a major difference in Fatih Mecca because Bakr, who were not, you know, they made alliances with the Prophet ﷺ and, uh, and, and, uh, and vice versa with Quraysh and that actually led to the conflict that led to the uh, conquest of Mecca or Fatih Mecca. But to go back to the original point, is, and, and this is just a diagram to show that of Ibrahim came two sons, Ismail and Ishaq, and of Ishaq came Ya'qub, and of Ya'qub came Al Asbat, the twelve tribes of Israel, and of Ismail came the twelve tribes that actually, twelve sons that eventually gave uh, the uh, birth and lineage to the uh, Arabized or the Al Arab al Musta'ridah, or the Adnani Arab. So the, the, the point is of Yemen. Many Arab tribes came, uh, came and they established many nations all over Arabia and on the borders of Arabia. Of them, uh, the Ghassanis. The Ghassanis were allies of the Byzantines and they actually occupied northern Arabia on the western part. And then you have the Manadira. Uh, and Manadira are Arab tribes of Yemeni origin that actually occupied the eastern uh, northern borders of Arabia and they were allies with the Persians. There were also the tribes of Himyar that remained around the, the southern part of Arabia. There are the tribes uh, of Kinda. There are the tribes of, of the different types of Najd that remained in Middle Arabia. And most of the Arabs actually at that time belonged in their origin or all the Arabs at that time belonged in their origin to that country of Yemen. So, to study the, a little bit about the history of Yemen and what happened, what sort of event actually occurred around the history of Yemen, and that actually leads us directly into the year of the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. The first kingdom that is known in history, in ancient history, in Yemen is the kingdom of Sheba, Mamlakatu Saba. And the well-known uh, history in the Qur'an and the story of the Qur'an is the story of Bilqis, the queen of Sheba and her, her story with Sulaiman alayhi salam as we narrated. The historians say that that kingdom lasted for about 500 years between around 650 before uh, the, the birth of Isa alayhi salam into around 115 uh, BC. And after that kingdom, was ruined or, or perished, the local Yemenis had another kingdom and it's called the Kingdom of Himyar. The Kingdom of Himyar lasted from 115 BC to 350 of the Common Era, the uh, 350 CE. Now, in 300, uh, around 340, there was an invasion, an invasion of Yemen. And that invasion came right across the Strait of the Red Sea. The Strait from the Red Sea separates, of, separates Al Habasha, separate, separates Abyssinia from Yemen. And the Habashis, the Abyssinian, crossed and invaded Yemen. Who are the Abyssinians? The Abyssinians are African nation. They are an African nation that actually 
they had the religion of Christianity. And they were allies with Byzantium. And they had a great civilization, great power and great armies. And their king, always known as a Najashi. A Najashi is the name of the king of Abyssinia. Like Qaisar, Caesar is king of the Byzantium, or the Romans. And Kisra, Kosros, is the king of the Persians. So the invasion of the Abyssinians occurred around 340 of the Common Era. And that started the first Abyssinian rule of Yemen. And that's when Christianity settled in Yemen. The Christianity settled in Yemen and there is a, a cities in Yemen that, that were completely Christians. Not only sp it spread and it was really a solid religion in that part of Arabia and many Arab tribes actually embraced the Christian religion in that area. There is also Christianity actually spread into other tribes like Tayyip in, in, into the, the Najd, into the middle of Arabia. And uh, Adi ibn Hatam, one of the Sahaba, the Prophet وسلم, was known to be a Christian person from that tribe of Tayyip. However, Christianity, the stronghold of Christianity in Arabia was established in Yemen at that time under the Abyssinian rule uh, of 340 of the Common Era. Then the Abyssinians were kicked out, they were expelled by the locals, by the Yemenis again one more time, and that happened in the, in the year 378 of the Common Era. Then an event occurred. Now the Yemenis that actually controlled Yemen, what we know about them, and the scholars have two different opinions about them. They said some of them were Christian, some of them were Jewish, and the majority of them were pagans. The majority of them were sun worshippers, or idol worshippers. And at that time, there was a major event occurred in Yemen that actually shook the economy and the social fabric of the Yemeni society to the ground. And that event is actually recorded in the Quran. And many of the historians will narrate that and they put it around the year 450 of the Common Era. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah named Saba. The surah itself is called Surah Saba, Shiva, Yemen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Saba, immediately after the story of the Queen of Sheba is finished with Sulaiman alayhi salam, Allah says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لِسَبَعٍ فِي مَسْكَنِهِمْ آيَةٍ جَنَّتَانِ عَيَّمِينِ وَشِمَالٍ كُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِ رَبِّكُمْ وَاشْكُرُوا لَهِ بَلْدَةٌ طَيِّبَةٌ وَرَبٌّ غَفُورٌ Allah says, there was for Saba, for Shiva, aforetime a sign in their homeland, two gardens to the right and to the left. Two gardens to the right and to the left. Eat of the provision, eat of the sustenance provided by your Lord. And be grateful to Him. A land that is fair and happy. Baldatun tayyiba. Warabbun ghafoor and the Lord that is oft forgiven. So Allah is telling us here in Surah Saba how blessed were the people of Yemen were at that time. And the historians tell us that they had a dam. And that dam is called Saddu Ma'rib. The Sadd Ma'rib, the dam of Ma'rib, was a dam that actually let the people of Yemen control the, the rain and the water that falls in that area and they were able to, to, uh, to use that water to its maximum benefit and they had gardens and they had luscious uh, cultivations that actually made Yemen very wealthy and very blessed. And then what did they do? How did they respond to this bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah says in Surah Saba, فَأَعْرَضُوا But they turned away from Allah. So they turned away from the religion of Allah. They turned away from Tawheed. They turned away from the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says they were punished. فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ سَيْلَ الْعَرِمِ وَبَدَّلْنَاهُمْ بِجَنَّتَيْهِمْ جَنَّتَيْنِ ذَوَاتَيْ أُكُلٍ خَمْطٍ وَأَثْلٍ وَشَيْءٍ مِّن سِدْرٍ قَلِيلٍ ذَلِكَ جَزَيْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَفَرُوا وَهَلْ نُجَازِي إِلَّا الْكَفُورِ 
But they turned away from Allah. And Allah says, and we sent against them the flood. And you will see in some translation, released from the dam, Sayl al arim they were an enormous, torrentious flood that just flooded that entire area. That was, that ruined their, their gardens. And Allah said, and then we, Allah converted their two gardens into gardens producing bitter fruits and tamarisk and some few stunted trees. So instead of these luscious producing fruits, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala substituted them, punished them because of their rejection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with just desert cultivation, bitter fruit, things that will not be useful by mankind. And Allah says, ذَلِكَ جَزَيْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَفَرُوا And that was their acquittal. We gave them because they ungratefully rejected faith. And Allah says, and never do we give such requital except to such as are ungrateful rejectors. So from this verse, from these three verses in Surah Sabah, we know that a disaster occurred in Yemen. And that disaster occurred because of their kufr, because of their disbelief, because of their rejection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars say that that event actually triggered a second wave of immigration from Yemen. Many of the Qahtani tribes from Hinyar, from, from those other tribes, big tribes that used to live in Yemen, actually triggered that wave of immigration and they left Yemen because of that transformation that occurred in Yemen. And actually some of the scholars say that because those Arab tribes were, were affected by the flood, they vowed to never live close to any body of water. And they were much more comfortable in the dryness of the desert than they were close to big areas of bodies of water because when they did that, their great-grandfathers would tell them how that turned against them and how they were flooded and how the punishment came upon them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues in Surah Saba about another blessing and another punishment to the, to the people of Saba and to the people of Yemen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ وَبَيْنَ الْقُرَى الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا قُرًا ظَاهِرَةً وَقَدَّرْنَا فِيهَا السَّيْرِ سِيرُوا فِيهَا لَيَالِيَ وَأَيَّامًا آمِنِينَ Another blessing was given to them between them and the cities on which, we, on which we had poured our blessings, we had placed cities in prominent positions. And between them, we had appointed stages of journey in due proportion. Travel within, secure by night and day. Allah says that, that they had prosperous trade. Their commercial routes, Allah that gave them, those commercial routes were prosperous, and safe commercial routes. And when the scholars interpreted those verses, they said it was all the way between Yemen and Philistine. When you think, which, which are the cities that Allah blessed? Which, which is the holy land? Where is the blessed land? It is the land of Philistine. May Allah lift the calamity of, over Philistine. And, and the, these, the, the merchants of Yemen and the trade routes would go all the way there and back. And Allah gave them safety uh, throughout these long journeys. Some other scholars say it was all, it was, it was between Mecca. It was between Mecca and, and Yemen. Or between uh, other places that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed. But the majority say they had trading routes that would go all the way to Asham, all the way to, to, to Syria, Palestine, and back, and Allah blessed them and gave them that bounty. And Allah reminds us the same way when, when Quraysh rejected the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah named Surah Quraysh, لِإِلَافِ قُرَيْشٍ إِلَافِهِمْ رَحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ So the same blessing that Allah blessed Quraysh with, that they had the journey of the winter and the journey of the summer. And they had safety and they had great provision and great sustenance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these two journeys. 
So how did they respond to the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَاعِدْ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارَنَا وَظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَحَادِيثَ وَمَزَّقْنَاهُمْ كُلَّ مُمَزَّقٍ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِكُلِّ صَبَّارٍ شَكُورٍ But they said, O oh Lord, place long distances between our journey stages. But they wronged themselves at length. We made them as tale to be told. And we dispersed them in all scattered fragments, verily. And this are signs for every soul that is patiently constant and grateful. grateful. So Allah says that they did not appreciate that bounty of Allah. They, they actually wanted to go even further. They were not satisfied, they were not content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. And the ulama said there are two different interpretations here. They either were, and both are, both interpretations go to the same idea. That they did not like what Allah has given them. They were not content, they were not satisfied. The first interpretation is they were praying to Allah that this journey is way too long for them. So they wanted Allah to just make their provision come to them without traveling uh, the distance. The second one is they were not happy with the routes that they, that they had and they wanted to even go beyond that. And, and there, there are really two different ways of looking at this from the Arabic language standpoint. Either one, Allah told us that they transgressed upon themselves by rejecting that bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not appreciating His favor. And Allah says, فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ hadith. They were just turned into nothing but tales. وَمَزَّقْنَاهُمْ كُلَّ مُمَزَّقْ And we dispersed them in scatter fragments. And that actually is uh, what the ulama said is an evidence that many of the people and the tribes that were in Yemen were scattered all over Arabia. They were, they, are, they were not a very cohesive kingdom anymore and they turned into different tribes and different uh, clans that were all over the Arabian Peninsula. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in that there is a sign, كُلِّ صَبَّارٍ shakur For all, everyone that is patient and grateful to Allah. Because these are the two things that they were not, that they were not doing. These are the two traits that the people of, of Sheba or the people of, of Saba, they were not expressing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A sabr, to be patient and to endure and to persevere, and then to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be grateful for whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. So, from Yemen came a lot of Arab tribes that dispersed all over Arabia and they are called Al-Arab Al-Aribah or the Qahtani Arabs. What happened after that? Paganism continued to rule in Yemen for many years after the destruction of, of the economy and the, and the financial ruins of Yemen there was still some existence, there is a still existence of many cultures there and many tribes and people that actually inhabited that area. But paganism ruled for 125 years according to the historians between 450 and 525. Now, at that time, a lot of the small towns in Yemen, small cities, especially in the north, there was a city called Najran. Najran is a Yemeni city that was a Christian city. And many monks and many uh, Christian people lived in that area. Now the paganism that was ruling Yemen, there was a major incident that occurred around 523 of the Common Era. And a lot of these dates uh, really are, are, are from historians. Uh, obviously, the dates are not in the hadith and the seerah or uh, of the Prophet wasallam. But many scholars reflected upon that and many historians put a lot of these dates to, co to really coincide with the documented historical facts of what occurred. What happened is there was an incident that turned tyranny against the Christian population of Yemen. And that occurred in the year 523 of the Common Era. 
In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, and this is narrated on the authority of Suhaib al-Rumi, Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi, that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about a king that lived before the Sahaba. And the scholars, the interpreters of hadith, and the interpreters of the Qur'an, they placed that king and that story in Yemen, Wallahu a'lam. So we will go over that story, and we will go over the verses that were revealed, that the scholars say was revealed about that particular story. The Prophet ﷺ said according to the hadith as narrated in Sahih Muslim on the authority of Sahib al-Rumi radiallahu an, the Prophet said, كَانَ مَلِكٌ فِي مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ There was a king that lived before you. وَكَانَ لَهُ سَاحِرٌ And he had a sorcerer that would conduct his affair. And it is well known that the majority of those kings and rulers that have sorcerers and magicians in their courts and they can connected with them, they are pagans. They are not people that follow scripture. They're not followers of the Abrahamic faith. They're not followers of Christianity. They're not followers of Judaism. So that king, according to the majority of those who interpret hadith, was a pagan king. So when that sorcerer reached an advanced age, قَالَ لِلْمَلِكِ إِنِّي قَدْ كَبُرْتُ I've reached a very advanced age. I'm an old man now. فَبْعَثْ إِلَيَّ غُلَامًا أُعَلِّمْهُ السَّحْرِ So send me a young man, a young person, so I can teach him my, my trade. So I can teach him sihr, sorcery, black magic. So the king sent him a young man, a young boy. فَبْعَثَ إِلَيْهِ غُلَامًا يُعَلِّمُهُ فَكَانَ فِي طَرِيقِهِ إِذَا سَلَكَ رَاهِبٌ So when the boy, when that young man would be on his way to the sorcerer, to the magician, to learn the trade of magic, he would see a monk. There was a monk in his place, in his place of worship, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَقَعَدَ إِلَيْهِ وَسَمِعَ كَلَامًا So the boy would sit by the monk and he would listen to what the monk is saying. فَأَعْجَبَهُ And he would admire, he would like what he hears. فَحَتَّى إِذَا أَسَأَتَ السَّاحِرُ ضَرَبَهُ فَشَكَ ذَلِكَ إِلَى الرَّاحِبُ so he would be late to the, to the sorcerer. You know, he's going to sorcery school. You know, not Harry Potter type of deal. This is real, you know, real deal. So that, that boy would be beaten by the sorcerer because he's late for his class, for his black magic class. So when, the, when he, so he complained to the, to the monk. He said, when I'm sitting with you and I'm hearing what you say, I'm late and I'm getting beaten by the sorcerer. So the monk said, فَإِذَا خَشِيتَ السَّاحِرَ قُلْ حَبَسَنِي أَهْلِي وَإِذَا خَشِيتَ أَهْلَكَ فَقُلْ حَبَسَنِي السَّاحِرَ So he said, when, you're, when, the, when the sorcerer asks you why you're late, you just say, my, my family held me back. And when you back, when, when you st stop my knee on your way back, from the sorcerer to your family, and when your family ask you why you're late, then, then tell them that the sorcerer held me back. The sorcerer delayed me. So he got away with, with these uh, two stories, and he was able to spend more time with the monk. So he was learning from the monk the religion of Christianity. So he was conflicted. This little boy had knowledge from the sorcerer and he would see the power of black magic and he will see that, that whatever the black magician is, whatever the sorcerer is teaching him out of the, of the sorcery. And then when he would go to the monk, he would also admire the words of the monk. And he was conflicted in his heart, which one is really truth, truthful? Which one is the one that I should follow in my life? So one time, as this is the hadith of the Prophet and it's by the way written in English, but I just, um, it's really a long hadith, so we'll, we'll go over the translation later. Uh, and it is going to be available inshallah on the website. And then one time he found a big beast that is holding people from their path, whatever that beast is, some desert lion or whatever, but that beast 
was not allowing people to pass through and they were afraid. And the Prophet said, حَتَّى إِذَا أَتَى عَلَى دَابَّةٍ عَظِينَةٍ قَدْ حَبَسَتِ النَّاسِ فَقَالَ الْيَوْمَ أَعْلَمْ السَّاحِرُ أَفْضَلْ أَمِ الرَّاهِبُ أَفْضَلْ He said, today I will test which one is better, the sorcerer or the monk. So he took a stone, فَأَخَذَ حَجَرًا فَقَالَ اللَّهُمْ إِنْ كَانَ أَمْرُ الرَّاهِبِ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ أَمْرِ السَّاحِرُ فَاقْتُلْ هَذِهِ الدَّابَّةِ حَتَّى يَنْضِي النَّاسِ So he took that stone and he said, Oh Allah, if the monk is more beloved to you than the sorcerer, if the affair of the monk is more truthful than the sorcerer, then let that beast be killed with that little stone. And then he threw the stone up on the beast and the beast died. The beast was killed. So he ran to the monk and he said, this is what happened. So the monk said, Ay bunay, anta al-yawma afdalu minni, qad balagha min amrika ma ara, wa innaka satubtala, fa in ibtalayta fala tadulla alayhi. He said, oh my son, today you are better than me. He is given a karama. He is given a small miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he was able to kill a big beast with that small stone in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the monk said, today you are better than me. And just because you're a good worshiper, now because you're a true believer, you will be tested. See this, how many lessons we can take from the hadith. That when, when someone's faith reaches a certain point, then some calamity is going to occur to them. So they can be tested in their faith. So the monk said, you will be tested. So when you are tested, when you are hit with that adversity, don't point towards me. Don't tell people where you got your knowledge from. فَلَا تَدُلَّ عَلَيْهِ So the, the, this young boy was given now a, a karama from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was honored by Allah and small miracles will occur in his hands. فَكَانَ يُبْرِئُ الْأَكْمَهَ وَالْأَبْرَصَ وَيُدَاوِي النَّاسَ مِنْ سَائِرِ الْأَدْوَى So he would go and he would cure the blind and he would cure the leper with the, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to this hadith. So one time, the, the rest of the story as the Prophet narrates, فَسَمِعَ جَلِيسٌ لِلْمَلِكِ قَانَ قَدْ عَمِي فَأَتَاهُ بِهَدَايَ كَثِيرًا So a, a man that sits in the court of the king came to that boy and he brought a lot of expensive gifts with him. And that that person that was close to the king was, was blinded by a disease. So he turned blind and he heard that there is that such and such boy who can cure blindness. So he brings him all of these gifts and he would, uh, he gave to him, like that's what their habit is, is if you go to a sorcerer, fortune teller, you have to pay. You have to take, you know, give him expensive gifts and pay him money. So he got expensive stuff and he went to the boy. And he gave it the money and he said, ما هنا لك أجمع إن أنت شفيتني. You take all of this if you can cure my blindness. So the boy replied in all calmness. فقال إني لا أشفي أحدا. I don't cure anybody. وإنما يشفي الله. Allah the one that is curing people. Allah is Allah cures. I don't cure anyone. فإن أنت آمنت بالله دعوت الله فشفاك. So there is a condition. I don't want any, any money. I don't want any gifts. I don't want any of these you know, expensive stuff. All I want of you to do is to believe in Allah. And then I will pray to Allah, supplicate to Him that He will cure you after you believe in Him. And Allah will cure you. So he said, I believe in Allah. He believed in the religion of Tawheed. And the boy supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the cure was given to this blind person. So he saw. So he came to the king court. He's a, somebody that is used to frequent the king. So the king saw him coming and he knows he's a blind person and all of a sudden this blind person can see. So the king looks at him and he said, Who gave you your vision? Who gave you your eyesight back? So the uh, man said, Rabbi, my lord. So the king said, وَهَلْ رَكَ رَبٌ غَيْرِي So you have a lord other than me? You have a god other than me? هَلْ لَكَ رَبٌ غَيْرِي قَالَ رَبِّي وَرَبُّكَ اللَّهِ My lord and your lord is Allah. So he took him and he imprisoned him and he started torturing him. This is an authentic hadith 
narrated in Sahih Muslim. So the Prophet says, فَأَخَذَهُ فَلَمْ يَزَلْ يُعَذِّبْهُ حَتَّى دَلَّ عَلَى الْغُلَامِ So he started torturing him until he pointed to the boy. He said, that, that young person is the one that, that helped me get cured with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَجِئَ بِالْغُلَامِ So the king said, the king knew the ghulam. How did he know the ghulam? Because he's the one that actually sent him to the magician, to the sorcerer in the first place. He said, Ay Bunay, قَدْ بَلَغَ مِنْ سِحْرِكَ مَا تُبْرِئُ الْأَكْمَهَ وَالْأَبْرَصِ Your magic now reached the point that you actually can cure the, bl the blind and the leopard. He sent him to magic school. And he said, wow, this magic of yours now is strong enough that you can cure blind people? So, وَتَفْعَلْ وَتَفْعَلْ You do this and you do that. So the, the, the boy said, إِنِّي لَا أَشْفِي أَحَدًا بَلْ يَشْفِي اللَّهِ I don't cure anyone. Allah cures. So he took him and he continued to torture him. Exactly what the monk told him is going to happen, happened to him. A lot of time the word of La ilaha illallah brings a lot of pain and suffering to those who want to really suffer for it. أَسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ الْعَفَوَ وَالْعَافِيَةِ But tribulation occurred the way that that monk predicted. So this boy was tortured and tortured until he gave the name of the monk. He gave the name of a rahib. فَجِئَ بِالْرَاهِب So he, they brought the monk. فَقِيلَ لَهُ رْجِعَ دِينِكَ You are, you know, you're the head of this whole situation. You turn back from that religion. You have to go back to the religion of the king. فَأَبَى So he refused. So he brought فَأُتِيَ بِالْمِنْشَارِ they brought a saw, and they sawed him, they sawed, they saw, is it sawed or saw? <laughs> so, they cut him in half <laughs> with the saw. So they cut that monk in half. And the, the court, the, the, the person of the court, the, the blind person that was cured by the, the faith, he was also brought in that position. Subhanallah. This is a huge test of Iman. Somebody is being sawed in half in front of you, and then they brought him and they said, that is, that is your destiny. That is what's going to happen to you if you don't go back to the religion of the king. So he refused. He knows, La ilaha illallah. He saw what La ilaha illallah, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he had the faith. So they put the saw in his head, and they cut him in half. And now they brought the boy. I want to just get rid of this whole situation. These three, the monk, the believer, and then the boy. So now they brought the boy and they said, turn away from that religion. Turn away from Tawheed. And he refused. And then the king wanted to teach the entire uh, city a lesson with this boy. This is the boy that would uh, you know, cure the blind and cure the leper and do these miracles. So he wanted to show the weakness of that boy. He wanted to execute him in a public way. So people know who is ha who's, who's one that has more power. The king wants people, his ummah, his nation, to know that he is the most powerful person. So he wanted that, that boy to be executed publicly. He said, take him up to the top of the mountain. And then threw him away from the top of the mountain and let everybody see how, what is the end, what is the punishment of those who turn away from the worship of the king. So the, the soldiers, they take him up there and he said, at the top of the mountain, ask him if he would turn, if turn back to my religion and leave, leave the religion of Allah. Or just throw him away. So at the top of the mountain, as the Prophet ﷺ said, he prayed, Allahumma kfinihim bima shit. Oh Allah, protected me, protect me from them in any way you like, in any, in any uh, method that you choose, in any way that you will. Or protect me from them by your will. Ikfinihim bima shit. And by the way, this is a very short dua that the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he has, he is facing a powerful enemy, he would say, Allahumma kfinihim bima shi'it. Allahumma kfinihim bima shi'it. O oh Allah, protect me from them in any way, by your will, or by any way you will. 
So what happened is the mountain started shaking and the soldiers of the king fell off the top of the mountain and that boy was left standing on the top of the mountain. The Prophet said, He didn't run away. Now, now he's, all the soldiers that were executing him, they're killed on top of the mountain. What would any of us do? Run away to farthest. No, he went back to the king. Because now it is a matter of faith. It is a challenge where the entire city, the entire population should see who is more powerful and who is on the right path. That king or the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he came to him. And the king said, مَا فَعَلَ أَصْحَابُكَ where, where, where are the soldiers? Where are the, the companions that I sent with you? He said, كَفَانِيهِمُ Allah. Allah protected me from them. So he gave him another. He gave him to another group of soldiers or, or, or friends. And he said, اذهبوا به فاحملوه في قرقور فتوسطوا به البحر فإن رجع عن دينه وإلا فاقذفوه He said, take him in a boat. Qarqur is a small boat. It's like a, you know, a rowing boat. And take him away into the sea. And then ask him if he would turn away from the religion of Allah and come back to my religion or just throw him in the sea. So they took him away and they went into the middle of the sea. And then what happened, Allah, the Prophet said, فَانْكَفَأَتْ بِهِمُ السَّفِينَةُ فَغَرِقُوا The boat turned away, the bird turned over, they were thrown off the boat, and he came back walking to the king. فَجَاءَ يَمْشِي قَالَ لَهُ الْمَلِكُ مَا فَعَلَ أَصْحَابُكُ What happened to them? He said, كَفَانِيهِمُ اللَّهُ Allah protected me. So the king now is just reaching that point of challenge that he knows if he keeps on doing this it just going to weaken him even further it's going to make it make him the ridicule of his subjects and it's only showing the truthfulness of this boy but he want to get rid of him he want to just get rid of him because in his mind this is the rebel this is the one that dare to say la ilaha illallah if i kill this boy everything will be fine and everything will be over so the boy said, he wanted to, to give him, you know, the, the, the final answer. He said, "Inna khalasta biqatili." You will not be able to kill me. He said, "Hatta tafalu ma amurakabe." bi. I will give you the only way that you can kill me. I will tell you how you can get rid of me. He said, "What? What can I do?" Wa ma huwa? Qala tajma'u nas fi sa'idin wahid. First, you have to gather the population. Gather the people. Don't you want a public execution? Get everybody together. ثُمَّ تَصْلِبُنِي عَلَى جِذَّ And then tie me to a trunk of a tree. ثُمَّ خُذْ سَهْمًا مِنْ كِنَانَتِي Take one of my arrows. And then put the arrow, um, put the arrow in the arch. In the arch. And then put, ثُمَّ ضَعِ السَّهْمَ فِي كَبِدِ الْقَوْسِ Put the arrow in the, in the middle of this arch. And then said, and then say, Bismillahi Rabbil Ghulam. In the name of Allah, the Lord of this boy, and then shoot the arrow towards me, and then I will be killed. So the king, he tried every other way that he knows before, and it's not working. So he said, whatever. You know, I want to just get rid of him. So the king got people, and then he gathered them and he did exactly what the boy told him and he said Bismillahi Rabbil Ghulam in the name of Allah, the Lord of this boy and he threw the arrow towards him and the boy was killed instantly and then the Prophet said فَوَقَعَ السَّهْمُ فِي صَدْغِهِ فَوَضَعَ يَدَهُ فِي مَوْضِعِ السَّهْمِ فَمَاتْ he put, the, the arrow fell into his temple and he put his hand on the temple and he died a martyr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the people that were watching all of this, they were not cheering for the king. They were not saying, oh, this is, the king is so powerful. He said, آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ الْغُلَامِ آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ الْغُلَامِ آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ الْغُلَامِ And the Prophet ﷺ said it three times. We believe in the Lord of this boy. We believe in the Lord of this boy. We believe in the Lord of this boy. Now, instead of having three people, three believers on his hand, now he has a mass rebellion on his hand, this king. So the king said, 
فأتى الملك فقيل فأتي الملك فقيل له أرأيت ما كنت تحذر قد والله أنزل الله بك حذرك قد آمن الناس This is what you were afraid of The soldiers of the king said This is what we were afraid of Is people to turn away And believe in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So these tyrants What did they do? فأمر بالأخدود في أفواه السكك فخدت وأضرم النيران وقال من لم يرجع عن دينه فاحموه فيها So he ordered for trenches to be dug by the roads, by the pathways. And then people will be stopped. And fire will be, will be lit in those trenches. And anyone who still believes in Allah will be thrown in that fiery trench. And he said, whoever does not go away from the religion of Allah, then throw him in him. And so they did. And then the Prophet ﷺ tell us about a woman, a mother with her infant child. And the Prophet says, فَفَعَلُوا And they did. حَتَّى جَاءَتِ امْرَأَةٌ وَمَعَهَا صَبِيٌّ لَهَا فَتَقَاعَسَتْ أَنْ تَقَعَ فِيهَا So a woman came with an infant. So she re reluctant, she was reluctant from falling into the fire. She is a mother and she does not want her infant boy to burn alive. And then Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said that the infant spoke and he said, Ya Ummah, isbiri fa innaki ala al haq O oh my mother, persevere and be patient because you are on the right truth. And, and another hadith, this is one of the infants that actually spoke in, in, in infancy. One of them is obviously Isa ibn Maryam uh, alayhi salatu wasalam. This is the second infant. And the third infant is an infant of the uh, hairdresser of the daughter of Fir'aun. When she was being thrown in the boiling water, her infant son also spoke and told her that you are on the righteous path. You are on the right path of truth. This hadith is narrated by Suhaib al-Rumi. Suhaib is a muhajir. He is from Mecca. This is a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ is showing his sahaba and showing this ummah. And this whole story is showing us that there is a price for faith. And sometimes the price is torture. Sometimes the price is execution. Some people give their lives. Some people see their children getting burned alive. So any distress that the sahaba were facing any distress that, that they had, the Prophet will always let them know that those before you have endured, those before you have done a lot and sacrificed a lot in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khabbab ibn al-Arat came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, ala tad'u lana. O Prophet of Allah, why don't you supplicate to Allah? That they are being tortured. Khabbab came and his back was burned because they would take the the glowing, the fiery coal, and they put him on the back of Khabbab, so he would go back to worshipping idols, and he would leave the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Khabbab came out of torture session, and he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why don't you ask Allah to stop this? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, don't hasten, those before you, they would be brought, and a saw would be put in their head, and they would be split in half, and none of them would turn away from their religion. And this story is nothing but a testimony to the strength of faith. When the faith settles in the heart, Wallahi, no one can turn people away from Iman. No one. There is no mu'min, no believer, no true believer can really turn away from faith in, in, in any possible way. Even if it means torture, even if it means giving their lives for it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Buruj, and the ulama said that this hadith is linked to, obviously to this very ayah, and that's the explanation of this, of these very, uh, of, this, of this surah, and this is the explanation of these ayahs. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa-samai dhati al-Buruj. Wal-yawmi al-maw'ud. Wa-shahidin wa-mashhud. قتل أصحاب الأخدود 
النار ذات الوقود إذ هم عليها قعود وهم على ما يفعلون بالمؤمنين شهود وما نقموا منهم إلا أن يؤمنوا بالله العزيز الحميد والسماء ذات البروج by the sky displays displaying the zodiacal signs and displaying the celestial objects the constellations واليوم الموعود and by the promised day of judgment قتل أصحاب الأخدود by one that witnesses and the subject وشاهد ومشهود and by by one that witnesses and the subject of the witness Allah swears by those who witness that calamity and by the people that actually were subject to that calamity قتل أصحاب الأخدود wow to the makers of the pit of fire to those trenches of fire and nari ذات الوقود fire supplied abundantly with fuel إذ هم عليها قعود behold they sat over against the fire وهم على ما يفعلون بالمؤمنين شهود and they those criminals they are witnessed all that they were doing against the believers and what is the crime that they've committed what is the crime of those people that they were burning alive وما نقموا منهم إلا أن يؤمنوا بالله العزيز الحميد and they ill-treated them, they mistreated them for no other reason than that they believed in Allah, exalted in power, worthy of all praise. The people that were burned in the pits of fire in the trenches were Christians. And the people that burned them were pagans. So what happened is the kingdom of Abyssinia, the Christian kingdom of Abyssinia, that is before Islam, where Christianity was the last religion that was sent to mankind. They led a army back to Yemen to protect the Christian subjects of Yemen that were being tortured, tormented, and burned alive. And that, that expedition occurred, according to the historians, in 525 of the common era. Now you notice it was coming close to a very important date. 525 of the common era when they crossed the sea and that was the second Abyssinian invasion of Yemen and a commander called Ariat. Ariat was able to lead an army across the sea and occupy Abyssinia and he was the viceroy of Abyssinia and under the king of the, the viceroy of Yemen under the king of Abyssinia. What happened in there, as Ariat was in the army, he was a tyrant and he started suppressing other people. And his, one of his commanders called Abraha. Abraha was one of the commanders under this viceroy of uh, the Abyssinian army. He led a coup and he killed his chief commander. He called, killed Ariat and he put himself as the viceroy over Yemen for the Abyssinian. And that occurred just before, between, most scholars said that occurred probably about 565 or so before, uh, of the common era. Abraha wanted to establish Christianity in Arabia. And he started getting the Arab tribes to, to come to Christianity. But he would notice that those Arabs prefer to go to a different worship place than a Christian church. They were going to a place called Mecca. And in Mecca there is a house, they say, it was built to Allah by his prophet Ibrahim. And there were people on the Ibrahimic faith, but their faith was distorted after Ibrahim. And that would actually be the subject of next session. But those people were idol worshippers, and they would put those idols in the, in the house that they claim it is a house of Allah, and they called it a Kaaba. So he said, I will build them a better house. So he built a big church in Yemen called Al Qulais. And he said, No Arab should go to Mecca anymore, and they all have to come to my church to worship. A man heard of that, and he wanted, he was an ignorant Arab pagan. 
And he wanted to, to insult Abraha and insult his church. So he walks into the church and he would defecate. He would put dirt and, and impurities in the church. And Abraha became very angry according to the historians. So he vows that I will just destroy that Kaaba. I will destroy the house of worship that the Arabs go to. And there will be no house of worship left other than that church of Quleis. So Abraha in the year 570, around 570 and 571 of the common era, leads an army. And according to the scholars, that army was about 60,000 people. But he's an African commander from Abyssinia. And he led an instrument of war that the Arabs have never seen before. He led an elephant. And according to some historians, he had between 9 and 15 elephants in his army. They led by a huge elephant. And that huge elephant was trained to destroy buildings. Because they, you know, elephants have great power and great body mass, and if they plunge against an object, they can ruin it, they can destroy it. So they did not have bulldozers, right? But some occupying forces go and bulldoze people's houses and places of worship. He had elephants. And he wanted to take the elephant and use the elephant to destroy the cap. A lot of actually what occurred on the way between Yemen and Mecca is history, is not uh, narrated by, uh, by a hadith, but in, in the, the prelude to the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, of Abu Hatim and others, uh, there are some stories about what happened on the way. Some Arab tribes tried to stop him, but, but the power of Abraha and his army was overwhelming. And one, uh, one Arabic uh, uh, tribe uh, tried to stop him, and that's from Hinyar. And uh, because Hinyar were the rulers of Yemen before the Abyssinians came. So a king of Hinyar call, called uh, Dhunathar tried to stop him, and he was defeated. And the king himself, the Hinyari king, was taken as a prisoner. And the army continues until it reached a Ta'if. And a Ta'if. Mas'ud uh, al thaqafi uh, came and he actually pledged allegiance to the army of Abraha. And they sent a guide with Abraha to guide the army to the Kaaba. And that guide's name was Abu Rughal. And Abu Rughal died on the way. And his grave at the time of the Prophet ﷺ was a place where the Arabs would go and stone his grave because he, he, he helped an invading army against the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Abraha came to the, uh, the area of Mecca, and they settled in the valley of Muzdalifah. And as they come to, uh, to the sanctuary of Mecca, they started confiscating some of the camels, and some of the wealth that the Arabs had. And the, one of the noblemen of Quraysh, and who was the, the highest authority of Mecca at that time, his name was Abdul Muttalib, Ibn Hashim. And Abdul Muttalib, who was the grandfather of Prophet wasallam, was sort of the ruler and the governor of, of Quraysh, and the person that they would come to in matters of great importance. And they confiscated 200 of his camels, and they settled outside Mecca, waiting for the day of attack, so they can push their army, push their elephants, and destroy the Kaaba. Abraha sent one of the Hinyaris, one of the people that, he, that they were his prisoners, he said, go negotiate with the people of Mecca. I'm not coming to kill them. I'm not coming to occupy Mecca. All I want to do is destroy that house and go back. So that person comes to Abu Abdul Muttalib. And Abdul Muttalib said, Wallahi ma indana lahu qital. We have no power to fight him. We will let him 
between him and the house of Allah. If Allah let him destroy his own house, we are powerless. And then he, the, the person that came uh, to Abdul Muttalib, he said, come with me and meet uh, Abraha. Come to talk to Abraha. So Abdul Muttalib came and he started negotiating with some of the people around Abraha. Maybe Abraha would have some uh, reason and maybe would turn back to Yemen. And he talked to that Himyari king who was a, a prisoner in the hands of Abraha. And he said, uh, Can you provide any help for what is happening to us? And the Nafar said, I am myself, I'm a prisoner. I'm only a prisoner, I can be killed tomorrow or tonight. And Abdul Muttalib was let to come into the court of Abraha. And when Abraha saw Abdul Muttalib, Abdul Muttalib was a tall, handsome man who has presence. And Abraha saw him and he knew he was the, the, the greatest man in Quraysh at that time. So Abraha comes down from his chair and he sits next to Abdul Muttalib. And he said to Abdul Muttalib, what, what do you want? So Abdul Muttalib said, Ya ayyuha al-malik, innaka qad asabta fi yamalan azeeman farhudhu alayhi. Oh, you king, you have confiscated my wealth, you have confiscated my camels, so give him back to me. So Abraha said, قَدْ أَعْجَبْتَنِي حِينَ رَأَيْتُكَ I admired you when I saw you, but when you asked me for the camels, I've changed my mind about you. I thought you would ask me to save that house. You know, I'm coming here to destroy the house of worship, and you asked me about camels. So Abu Muttalib said this historical uh, uh, word, the phrase, he said, أنا رب هذه الإبل وللبيت رب يحمي. I'm the lord of these camels. I'm the, I'm the, these camels are in my custody. But the house has a lord, and that lord will protect the house. So Abraha said, ما كان ليمنعه مني. Your God cannot protect the house from me. So usually when people challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly, their end is not very good. So Abdul Muttalib left him, he took his camels, and the people of Mecca, all the people of Mecca at that time, they left the valley where the Kaaba is, and they went up to the mountains, so they can see what is happening. And they were watching as the army of Abraha coming from afar. Abraha moves his army into a valley, just, you know, if, if you've been to Hajj, actually, as you come from Muzdalifa to Mina, there is a small valley. That valley is actually, it's, a, it's like a water pathway. And that water pathway, the army of Abraha put the elephant to come towards the Kaaba. And the elephant would stop. Elephant would not move. They put him towards the Kaaba and the elephant would not move. And they would put like wedges and try to push the elephant, the elephant would not move. They turn him to the east, would walk. They turn him south, he would run, rolling him back to Yemen. Put him back into, into Wadi Mahsar, and the elephant would not move. And the Prophet ﷺ told us about this incident. This is not only history, this is, there is a hadith when the camel of the Prophet ﷺ at the time of Hudaybiyah refused to cut, walk into Mecca. The Prophet said, Habasaha Habisul Fil. The one that stopped the elephant is the one that stopped my camel. So the camel was stopped by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they tried everything they could and the elephant would not move. And then finally Abraha said, move on without the elephant. And as they tried to enter the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they find herds and flocks upon, I mean flocks upon flocks of birds coming from the west, from towards the sea. And those birds were as small as swallows. And with each bird had three small stones, one in its beak and one in each of, of its legs and its claws, and they would drop, you know. They drop those little beads, those little stones on the army of Abraham. And that little clay stone, as it falls, it will kill the soldiers of Abraham. A miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about, and the people of Quraysh witnessed with their own eyes. And those are the same people of Quraysh that many of them survived 
to the time of the Prophet ﷺ. What happened to Ashab al feed What happened to the companions of the elephants? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بأصحاب الفيل ألم يجعل كيدهم في تضليل وأرسل عليهم طيرا أبابيل ترميهم بحجارة من سجيل فجعلهم كعصف مأكول Did you not see how your Lord dealt with the companions of the elephant? Did he not make their treacherous plan go astray? And he sent against them flights of birds, striking them with stones of baked clay. Then did he make them like an empty field of stalks and straw which has been eaten up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ruined the army of Abraha right at the, right at the sanctuary of Mecca and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that a sign, made that an ayah of his existence, of his power in front of the eyes of people of Quraysh. And that was the prelude in their mind to what is coming to them, the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That year when that happened, it was 570 or 571 of the common era. And that is the year where the best of creation was born. The, some of the ulama that actually go to the uh, solar calendar, they looked and they said the army of Abraha most likely invaded in the month of January or February. And the Prophet ﷺ birth was around uh, 23rd of April of the year 571 according to Imam Nadawi. Wallahu alam, and Allah knows best. But that year was Amul Fil. The Arabs called it the year of the elephant because they witnessed something that is, that is of all power and it is a miracle before their own eyes on the power of Allah. Those idols that they were worshipping, they did not protect them against the invader. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that sent those flights of birds and Allah ruined a mighty army right before their own eyes. The Abyssinian, the Abyssinian existence in Yemen was destroyed after that army was destroyed. They only were able to stay in Yemen for four years. And after that, a Persian invasion came. And the Persian actually were in control of Yemen when the Prophet ﷺ was alive. And it lasted till the year 628. 628, the king of Yemen, who was a, a Persian ally, his name was Badan, became a Muslim. He embraced Islam and the Yemen came under the uh, rule of Islam. And inshallah, with the next session, we will speak about the uh, events of the birth of the Prophet wasallam, And we will speak about the uh, situation, the religious situation, the economical situation, the social situation in Arabia at the time of the birth of the Prophet wasallam. And with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help, we will start our study of the seerah of the best of creation, seerah to khayri al-anam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aqulu qawli hadha, wa astaghfirullah al-azim li wa lakum, faya fawza mustaghfirin.